Thank you for the shushing. And uh, <laughs> good evening, everyone, and welcome to the inaugural Faith Summerfield Memorial Lecture. My name is Jason Smith, and I am the president of the board of the Completed Life Initiative. I first would like to give a profound thank you to the staff of Columbia University School of Professional Studies, and particularly the bioethics program at Columbia University, and the Completed Life Initiative staff for making tonight's event happen. As we know, evenings such as these do not occur without months and tireless hours and sweat and tears of planning and preparation. So I thank you all for your efforts. The Completed Life Initiative was founded in 2019 by Faith Summerfield. Faith had a vision to change the world by sparking conversations about how to live well and how to die well. She would have been thrilled to see this sold out gathering here tonight and to know that a conversation is happening around this very, very important topic. Our staff has prepared a short video, which I'd like to show you, which will tell you more about our mission and work. After that, we will welcome David Hoffman from our board to introduce our celebrity speaker, Peter Singer. Thank you. We were founded in 2019 by Faith Summerfield. Yeah, Faith is a little bit of a firebrand. She took it personally that America had this, um, as she would describe it, sort of a, maybe on a good day, a dysfunctional relationship with death. Um, and then maybe on a bad day, you know, deep sort of pathological denial about death. A terminal illness hits people, you think, oh my gosh, it's just gonna be this downhill slide. And for many people, that's almost the completion. They say, my life is over now, I'm dying. My life will be completed when I no longer recognize it as my life. And if I recognize it as my life, I'm doing things, I'm, I'm participating in the things that give me joy, that I can make a difference in, and can give that purpose that gets me up in the morning. It gives me a clarity that people who haven't acknowledged and embraced their mortality don't have. Faith uh, always had this abiding passion that people should not have to suffer and that end-of-life options and thinking about death, talking about death, should not be limited to a healthcare setting or even a spiritual setting, that it should be very broad and expansive. And so we want to embrace culture and art and be able to challenge sort of long-held beliefs. We try fundamentally to respect people's autonomy and her view was that that respect should span living and dying. It is so good to see you all. Many familiar faces, many of my students, thank you for coming. Um, and more importantly, lots of unfamiliar faces. So welcome to our movement. My name is David Hoffman and I am the um, second vice president and secretary of the board of the Completed Life Initiative. And I'm an assistant professor of bioethics here at Columbia University in the School of Professional Studies. And uh, I'm just thrilled that we're all together in this really remarkable room. Uh, let me first say thank you to Bob Klitzman, the head of the bioethics program, um, <laughs> for bringing me into the master's program and giving me the opportunity to do all of the work I do which is teaching people to understand where death lives in our lives. So if these are topics that interest you, your work shouldn't end tonight. We have a slew of free online offerings and obviously courses and certificates and master's programs that are available to all of you. So um, don't stop. And with that, let's talk about Peter Singer. Peter Singer is um, widely regarded as the greatest living philosopher. 
to which Peter, um, in his um, clearly self-deprecating mode, said, doesn't say much for all of the other living philosophers. <laughs> but Peter's a special philosopher because, well, for one thing, he's a utilitarianist, or subscribes and aspires to project and grow an understanding of utilitarianism ascribed to John Stuart Mill, so it could be called Millian, but that doesn't roll off the tongue as well as Kantian. So we just deal with utilitarianism. And Peter is the perfect person to be giving this the first Faith Summerfield Memorial Lecture because he is what we might call an applied philosopher or a practical philosopher or a philosopher who speaks to not just the academic interests, but to people like us with lots of remarkable lectures and teaching and books like Animal Liberation Now, which I didn't know we were going to be selling downstairs, so I went to book culture this morning and picked up a copy to get it dedicated. Peter's a philosopher who traveled literally across the globe from Australia, where he was born and raised his kids, to Princeton, New Jersey, because it gave him a chance to lead a department of bioethics, a field that when Peter first came to Princeton, barely anyone knew of. So Peter is here to talk to us about philosophy in an applied and practical sense and tie together lots of strands of philosophy, including the rights of the animals that aren't human, to our discussions about what it means to live well and die well. So Peter, oh, excuse me. Peter will be joined on the stage, not by our friend and beloved colleague, Peggy Batten, who is uh, dealing with some medical issues back in Utah, but um, we're very confident that she'll have a swift recovery. Um, Peter will be joined on stage by, uh, this is quite remarkable for me especially, um, our oldest and our newest member of the Completed Life Initiative staff, Sarah Kiskadden Bechtel, who I um, grabbed out of a very comfortable research life to be Clee's first employed staff member. And our newest member, Mark Barger Elliott, still learning to pronounce that, um, who just became uh, the executive director of the Completed Life Initiative. So welcome all three of you, please. Take us on a journey. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Peter, on behalf of everyone here tonight, first, thank you. Thank you for your work. Thank you for your insights that have impacted so many. And thank you as well for your very gracious spirit that uh, so many of us have come to know. Um, and if I may, what I'd like to do to begin our time together tonight is take us to Byron Bay. Byron Bay is on the eastern tip of Australia. And to share with our audience, uh, along with Peter's work in ethics and effective altruism and regard for animals, Peter is also, in fact, a surfer. And he once wrote this. At the time of my single most magical surfing moment, I wasn't on a wave at all. At Byron Bay, Australia's easternmost point, I was paddling out to where the waves were breaking. The sun was shining, the sea was blue, and I was aware of the Pacific Ocean stretching ahead thousands of miles, uninterrupted by land until it reached the coast of Chile. A pulse of energy generated in that vast expanse of water neared a submerged line of rocks and reared up in front of me in a green wall. 
As the wave began to break, a dolphin leapt out ahead of the foam, its entire body clear of the water. It was a sublime moment, he wrote, but not such an unusual one. As many of my fellow wave riders know, we are the only animal that plays tennis <laughs> or football, but not the only animal that enjoys surfing. <laughs> How has your fascination and love of surfing informed your view of the world, of life, and how in particular we are to live our lives well? Well, that's a lot of big questions. Um, <laughs> before I attempt to answer them, let me say uh, thank you very much for inviting me to be here, and uh, thank you, Sarah, for all the organization that you did, and of course the other staff to make this event happen in this beautiful place. Um, I also wanted to add, and I only found out about this quite recently, that apart from dolphins, there's a more prosaic animal that surfs, if you go to YouTube and put in surfing duck, <laughs> you will find that there's a video of someone's pet white duck, which and this is somebody who was keen on, on surfing. I, um, and the duck swims out in the waves, waits for the wave to break at the right moment, then paddles fast <laughs> and catches the wave. Quite an amusing video. Um, but yeah, that's not really the answer to your question, I guess. Um, in terms of though, what Byron Bay evokes to me, and thank you for reminding me of, of that experience, um, I do really enjoy being out in nature, um, and that's one of the things about surfing. It's, it's a, you know, as much as anything, it's being there in the ocean, waiting for the waves, um, getting that energy which is just there. You don't need any fossil fuel motor to drive you onto it. Um, and, uh, that's definitely part of the, the experience. Um, I've never surfed at one of these artificial wave pools and I don't particularly want to. I don't think that would be the same experience at all. Um, though I, also, I also enjoy uh, hiking and um, out in, in the forests and hills. So to me, that is, that is part of my view of living well. But um, I think there's a lot of different views of, of living well. But I suppose for me, what I really wanted to talk about in, in talking about living well as well as dying well is um, living to some sense of purpose, living to a sense that you are actually doing something in the world, not only for yourself, not only enjoying those uh, experiences, but um, trying to, to make the world a better place through the fact that you've lived in it. Um, I think that's, that's an important first step to feeling that your life has been uh, a meaningful one and a fulfilling one, and I think we have that desire for that sense of meaning and fulfillment. And to expand on that, I know for many in the audience here, we wrestle with life's biggest questions, and we wrestle how to shape our life ethically. What insights can you share with us on how to live daily with purpose or to live our lives um, seeking to live well. Yeah, I think um, to think about ethical, living ethically um, in a world like this, you need to think about some of the facts about this world. So one of the crucial facts, I think, is that we live in an affluent country. Um, we're in a particularly affluent part of that country right now. Um, but we are among those who are um, definitely among the more fortunate people in the world. Probably most of us are among the global 1% in terms of um, income, affluence, um, security perhaps as well. Uh, and yet this is a world which has also several hundred million uh, people, used to, used to say a billion, but fortunately this has been reduced, uh, people living in extreme poverty as defined by the World Bank. The current definition is living on less than uh, $2.15 US a day, uh, or the purchasing power equivalent of, of that in, in that country. Um, so this is a, a very much diminished way of living. Uh, it is one which is associated with, uh, obviously, much shorter lifespans, um, uh, high child mortality, uh, and just a lot of things that make life much less pleasant than, than ours is. 
So I think one, one thing that you can ask yourself if you're in this, this global 1% or close to it um, is, is what can I do to contribute to making a change there? And um, one of the things that I'm most pleased with having done is I, I wrote a book called The Life You Can Save, which is about global poverty and what we can do uh, in relation to that. Um, but that wasn't turned out not to be just a book. Uh, at one stage there was a book, then a friend uh, talked me into setting up a website for it. Um, then a man called, called Charlie Bressler contacted me and said um, that he'd had a successful career in uh, men's clothing retailing um, and had done well, uh, but was always thinking that that wasn't what he did, wanted to really do with his life. So um, he offered to actually create an organisation that would promote the ideas of the life you can save. Um, and Charlie has done that. You can find the organisation online at thelifeyoucansave.org. Um, and Charlie actually said, in terms, in terms of living well, Charlie says that um, the first life that he saved through helping to found and, and create the life you can save was his own, because it gave that purpose and, and meaning and fulfilment to his life. So that's, that's one important issue that I think we can all think about um, making one of our own purposes. Um, but I've certainly worked for others. You um, or, or David uh, held up in introducing me, Animal Liberation Now. Um, I think the amount of suffering that we inflict on non-human animals is, is vast, uh, especially through industrial factory farming, which uh, in the United States alone is responsible for something like nine billion animals being raised and killed each year. And um, these animals are clearly capable of suffering. I'm just talking about vertebrate animals here. Uh, and um, factory farming is geared to producing them at the cheapest possible price, essentially irrespective of the impact it has on their well-being. Um, and you know, that that book, Animal Liberation, now has a lot of details on that, so I won't go into that now. But I've known a lot of wonderful people who have worked um, for reducing the suffering we inflict on animals as well. Um, and thirdly, I'll mention, um, we, we all know that we're in a global crisis concerned with climate change. Um, and whatever we can do to speed things up in terms of the transition away from fossil fuels and away from meat, because uh, the uh, meat is also a major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, um, is also something that is very much worthwhile to do at this time. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Peter, for diving into these important ideas and concepts that you've beautifully written about. Um, and thank you for so much for joining us on the stage. It's an honor and a delight to be here with you and with you, Mark. Um, and thank you again to the Columbia Bioethics Program and the Complete Life Initiative for hosting us this evening. Um, so in your book, Animal Liberation, uh, you returned 50 years later to publish Animal Liberation Now, which is available downstairs for purchase, as has been mentioned. Um, and the impact, impact of that book has been significant. Um, today, roughly 10 to 15 percent of Americans, for example, identify as vegan or vegetarian. Um, I know this topic is important to many in the audience. Um, how have your thoughts changed? Um, what have you revised? And where does the animal rights movement stand today, and where might it go in the future? Thank you. Uh, so I had to revise the book. Um, I had to change it because the two longest chapters in it are essentially factual chapters describing uh, the, one of the things that I just mentioned, uh, industrial animal production and also describing uh, research on animals. And obviously that has changed over the years. Uh, so it needed to be updated so that this wasn't just a historical description, but so that people could learn about how their uh, meat or animal products are being produced today, uh, learn what your taxes are paying for in terms of research on animals. Uh, and in looking at that, I had actually, I have to say, I had hoped for more change than I've seen. Um, there certainly have been some changes. Uh, I think the, the greatest changes have not been here in the United States. They've been in other countries, particularly in the European Union, which has made some progressive moves in terms of 
the way you can confine animals in uh, terms of egg-laying hens and uh, veal calves and pigs. Uh, so I see those as important initiatives. And I uh, would like the whole United States to follow suit. Some states have, states basically that have had uh, ballot initiatives. So California would be the largest of those states, which has had ballot initiatives to essentially make similar reforms to the European Union. But um, the states that have the biggest numbers of animals, of course, uh, uh, Iowa, uh, North Carolina, Nebraska, um, they have not changed their legislation. Um, they're dominated by these industries. And there is no really um, effective federal legislation on how you can keep uh, industrially farmed animals. Uh, so that's one disappointment. Um, also, I hope that uh, the introduction of institutional animal care and use committees would have made a bigger difference in what is being done to animals in the lab. It's made some difference again. Um, that's important, but, um, but not enough. Uh, then other parts of the book do reflect on the, well, on, on, on the ethical uh, principles that I think should uh, guide us in our treatment of animals. And I think the, the fundamental principle there is equal consideration for similar interests so that uh, the pain of a being, how, how serious that is, how much the pain of a being matters, does not matter with the species of the being. It may matter, different species may feel pain in different ways, or they may last longer or less, um, they may anticipate them in different ways, those things matter. But the fact that the being is not a member of the species Homo sapien isn't in itself a reason for saying its pain doesn't matter or its pain matters less. So that's, that's been a constant from, from when the, the book first came out. Um, but there are some further discussions of that. Uh, it's, much, it's a topic that's much more widely discussed. Uh, by people in philosophy departments, as well as outside them, um, by in philosophy courses. So a lot more people have come across that, and, and, and that's a good thing. Uh, and then the other thing that I wanted to do was to talk about the progress that the movement has made. Um, and as you say, uh, being vegan or vegetarian is something that is much more widespread. It's much easier to do. People don't automatically assume that you're some kind of crank. Um, if you are, as they, they did when uh, you know, I became, uh, well, first a vegetarian in 1970, beginning of 71, and uh, a lot of my friends really thought, uh, you know, my, my wife and I had sort of gone nuts in some way, um, uh, and not just by eating more nuts. Um, so so uh, that's, that's changed for the better. These alternative products are much more widely available. Uh, that's certainly a good thing. Um, and I hope that that's going to grow because I think the animals need it and the, and the planet needs it. Um, and I think actually our health needs it as well. And there's more research on that that's gone on uh, since the book first came out. Um, the Lancet established a commission to look at, uh, called the Eat Lancet Committee uh, Commission, to look at what we eat. Um, and a, that group of experts agreed that uh, both for the health of the planet and for the health of the populations, we should be eating. Uh, Little or no meat, phasing out red meat, um, little eating uh, less meat altogether, um, and uh, eating a lot more plant products. So I think that's, that's a good thing too. Um, and there is an animal movement. That's another uh, thing that has made a big difference. So the animal movement has produced change. Uh, it's produced change in a lot of different countries around the world. Uh, here in the United States, I've already mentioned, it's worked for those ballot initiatives in some states. And in other states, where there is no such uh, possibility. It's worked uh, on, in corporations, to get corporations to realise that their reputation and their public image would be enhanced by at least avoiding the worst forms of confinement. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, about a third of American hens now are not in those small wire cages that uh, they were when I produced the first edition which are now illegal across the entire European Union, um, and as I say, illegal in a few states uh, in the United States. But um, you know, if we can support those organisations, then uh, we will continue to make progress there. So that's what I really wanted to do in bringing out the, the new version of the book, to um, keep it relevant for um, another 20 years or so anyway. Um, I do hope you'll, you'll, you'll pick it up, and uh, if any of you would like to have it signed, um, 
Oh, there'll be an opportunity to do that later. Well, thank you, Peter. And, and hopefully 150 or more, it'll be relevant well, rel well into the future. Um, it's often said that our pets, our beloved pets, are treated more humanely than our beloved humans um, when it comes to end-of-life aid. And um, that is, we give our, our beloved pets and animals um, a peaceful death, but not humans. Do you think this saying has merit? I think this saying uh, does have merit in, in this very narrow respect in which we treat animals better than humans, or we can treat them better than, than humans. Um, and uh, that, again, is it's really evidence of the way in which um, the view of <coughs> the sanctity of human life um, is specifically a view that is limited to humans. Um, and, uh, of course, if it wasn't, then we wouldn't be eating all of these billions of industrially farmed animals either if we thought their life was sacrosanct. Now, you know, that's not what I'm arguing. As I said, I'm arguing about more about pain and suffering than I am about the, the right to life. But um, because we don't, we, we've never thought that uh, the lives of these animals are sacrosanct, so when one of our uh, companion animals becomes ill and is, the prospect of recovery is, is nil um, and they're suffering, we don't just allow them to s sort of die a natural death, as some people would say, you know, uh, we should do with humans. We, um, we take them to the vet and we um, have them uh, die in a humane way, <coughs> excuse me, in a humane way without, without unnecessary suffering. But, but there has been opposition to this um, in terms of humans. Again, <coughs> just as we've made some progress with some states in terms of um, how you can treat animals in intensive farms, so we've made some progress with some states in terms of whether you can get a physician to help you in dying, and there the difference between how we can treat our companion animals and how we can treat ourselves um, is, is not that great. And, and there are other countries around the world which have um, legislation that allows mm -hmm. people to choose when to die and to have a humane end to their life. But where that isn't legally possible, then yes, uh, companion animals have uh, a more humane ending, a, a better ending than mm. we often do. Mm. A quote in the book that stands yeah. out um, is, quote, nearly all the external signs that lead us to infer pain in other humans can be seen in other animals. Um, and you were mentioning this. Um, what is the role of pain and suffering <clears throat> as we build our ethical models of how to live our lives? Well, I think we, we all want to avoid um, pain and suffering, at least severe pain. Maybe, you know, those of us who want to run marathons will endure some pain of some, of some kind, <clears throat> but then it's instrumental because it's necessary for some other good that we want to achieve. But otherwise, I think we see uh, pain and suffering as uh, an aspect of our lives that we want to avoid, and when, when it becomes severe, when it starts to dominate our life, uh, it completely removes the positive qualities mm -hmm. from our lives. <laughs> And so I think that this is something that is, is really important and one of the reasons that I support um, voluntary aid in dying is that it's a completely unnecessary uh, suffering that, that mm -hmm. people have to go through where they cannot get um, assistance in dying. It's um, something that serves no purpose at all. It's something that uh, actually it is, is contrary often, not in all cases of course, but often contrary to the wishes, the autonomous choice of the person who is dying. And normally we respect and value autonomy and you know, we say that the right to liberty is, is one of these self-evident rights. Um, but here's a case where we don't allow people liberty even though they would not be harming anyone else. It would be a choice that they make and that the attending physician chooses to provide for them. It would not cost the state anything. In fact, it would very often save the state or save the medical insurance companies um, unnecessary costs. Uh, so it just seems to me to be really, as I say, a, a pointless form of suffering that we are still inflicting on people who would like to die sooner than they 
are actually able to die in those mm -hmm. jurisdictions where they do not have access to mm -hmm. uh, aid in dying. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We'll circle back to medical aid in dying in, in a moment. Yeah, and, and that's a lovely segue. I, I know our time tonight had two focuses. The, the first was how to, to live well, and we're grateful for your work in, in defining how to save a life, and, and in particular, our care and concern for animals. And so to make that pivot, um, to begin the conversation of how to die well, we wanted to ask your thoughts on the sanctity of life. Uh, you once forecast that the traditional view of the sanctity of life would collapse from scientific, technological, and demographic developments by 2040. But it feels like, and perhaps you might agree with this, this topic has reemerged in the light of the Dobbs ruling, also a religious and political question of the autonomy of one's body. What are your thoughts on the evolving understanding of, of the sanctity of life as it relates perhaps to how to live well, but also how, how to die well? Yes. So, um, as that phrase implies, I think the sanctity of life is ultimately a, a, a religiously based view. Um, and it's one which uh, religious leaders have been trying to uh, retain uh, to protect it. They think that it's really important um, to retain it. Um, and that's why uh, a large part of the opposition, uh, both to uh, voluntary aid in dying and also to uh, the right of a woman to choose to terminate her pregnancy, um, has been led by religious um, organisations. Uh, so I, I don't agree with the view that um, the idea of the sanctity of life is in itself an inherent value. And I think, in fact, our society has already moved away from it in a, a variety of ways. So um, in bioethical decisions, for instance, um, it's much more widely accepted now than it was when I started out working in bioethics in the 1970s that um, parents of a child born with uh, severe disabilities uh, who, when the child is on life support, let's say the child might be a very premature uh, birth, um, that uh, if they choose, and, or if the doctors consult them, as the doctors now accept they should, um, and say that the prognosis for this child is very poor, maybe there's been a massive brain hemorrhage and a lot of the brain has been lost, the child won't really be able to, not only to be independent, but maybe not even to... Uh, feed themselves or um, to smile at their parents, um, that, that parents have the right to ask for the life support to be withdrawn, knowing that that will end the life of their child. So I think it's a very fine line from saying, yes, you can withdraw the life support, to uh, saying that um, we really are justified in making choices as to whether it's better or worse that a child, uh, a newborn child should live. So I think it's, it's quality that should determine these choices, um, both for ourselves at the, at the end of life, um, but also in these, uh, fortunately, you know, rare cases, but cases that do occur in neonatal intensive care units in major hospitals all the time. So that's, you know, that change is one of the reasons why I said I think the, 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 the time when we will say the sanctity of life is a principle that we must preserve is is starting to come to an end. Um, I'll mention one other less well-known aspect of this that I think is also starting to come to something of a, of a crisis. In um, around 1980, uh, after a couple of committees investigated uh, the, the definition of death, um, the Uniform Law Commission, which is a body in this country made of representatives from all the states, um, recommended a new definition of death. Um, the de that, In addition to traditional definition of death, that is uh, uh, cardiopulmonary death, the cessation of the heart and of the circulation of the blood, um, they recognised that um, the irreversible cessation of all functions of the brain should be regarded as, as death. Now, um, was that a scientific change 
in a recognition of death, or was it an ethical shift? I think that it was an ethical shift. I don't think that there was a scientific view as to whether this is or is not death. There was a scientific view that people whose brains had irreversibly ceased to function um, were never going to get up and walk out of the hospital. They, um, uh, but um, it, it was also a decision which, and, and it's clear from some of the records, which was influenced by the fact, uh, by two factors. One is that the development of the ventilator in the 1950s had meant that um, people whose brains had irreversibly ceased to function were still taking up beds in intensive care units. Um, and secondly, uh, I don't think it's a coincidence that not too long before this, um, Dr. Christian Barnard in South Africa had performed the first heart transplant. Now, if you want to have hearts in good condition to do transplants, um, once the heart has stopped beating, it's likely to be damaged. But if you can remove it from somebody whose brain has irreversibly ceased to function, you will get it in better condition for doing a transplant. And you will also get other organs for transplants. So I think the uh, development of organ transplants was also a factor, and an, an ethical factor, in the change of definition of death. Now, um, that went on without much controversy. It was one of the few things which, which there was a lot of consensus in, in bioethics, it seemed. Um, until fairly recently. But a couple of things have happened. One is, um, it's become clear that the tests that doctors are using in this country and elsewhere um, to ascertain that brain function has irreversibly ceased do not actually test for the irreversible cessation of all brain functions. Um, they do not test for the cessation of the functions of the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. Um, and in fact, there was a fairly dramatic case a few years ago, a case of a, uh, yeah, a teenage uh, African-American woman called Jahai McMath, um, where she was certified as dead in a Los Angeles hospital um, after a pretty tragic operation, simple, what should have been a simple operation went tragically wrong. Um, and the family resisted the idea that she was dead. Uh, they went to court about it. The court ordered an in independent test to be done as to whether she was brain dead. That test also found her to be brain dead. Um, but the family were not ready to give up, and as a kind of compromise, the hospital said, OK, you can have your daughter. We'll release her on the respirator, and you can take her where you wish. They took her to New Jersey, which, although it has a brain death definition, allows patients to opt out of it, or allows families to opt out of it on kind of conscientious grounds. Uh, Jahai McBath, um, Continued her bodily functions continued, let's say that, you could say whether she lived or not, for another four years in that New Jersey hospital, mm -hmm. during which she got her first period, for example, um, and uh, she was examined by uh, some other doctors who said that this was a false positive, that although the test was carried out correctly, her brain had not completely ceased to function. There were parts of her brain still functioning. As a result of that, the, the Uniform Law Commission is now considering revising its definition of, of death. But in terms of doing that, they met in Hawaii in, in July, in fact, this, this year. In terms of doing that, it became apparent that there was different views as to whether you should or should not actually try and do a test or, or wait for the whole brain to have ceased to function. Because for one reason, you would lose a lot of these organs, these life-saving organs that are being transplanted. And secondly, a lot of people are saying, well, if it's clear that one is never going to recover consciousness, then there's no quality of life, and that's the important thing. And we shouldn't be trying to keep people alive if it's clear, and it is clear, that uh, you know, these tests do show that consciousness is irreversibly lost. So it'll be interesting to see whether, uh, you know, which party here prevails. There are some people who are saying, well, uh, if, they're not, if they're not really dead, if their brain's not ceased to function, then it's murder to cut their hearts out and give them to someone else. So it's, it's a real conflict in which we are going to have to resolve one way or the other, I think. Um, and perhaps that will start to also make people realise that um, in the end we don't believe in the sanctity of human life. We believe in the importance of preserving consciousness, particularly where there's a positive quality and, of course, also where people want to continue to live. Mm. That's helpful. Thank you, Peter. So... Pivoting a little bit back to this idea of death and dying, um, 
Your wife's brother chose medical aid in dying sometime last year. And for those unaware, medical aid in dying is legal in the United States in 10 states plus the District of Columbia. And requirements for aid in dying include a terminal diagnosis of six months or less to live, a declaration by two independent physicians that uh, the patient is eligible for medical aid in dying and has the cognitive ability of sound mind to make decisions for themselves. And as well, they have the physical strength to self-administer medication. Um, until recently, uh, residency was also an eligibility requirement. Um, however, Oregon and Vermont in the last year and a half or so have uh, removed their residency requirement. And interestingly, New Jersey is now, um, a New York Times article just posted on Sunday actually, uh, debating whether to remove its residency requirement to allow uh, Pennsylvania, New York, and Delaware residents to uh, access aid and dying in New Jersey. So regarding your brother who received MAID uh, last year, I know this is a personal question. Um, what was that experience like for your family? Well, obviously it was a very sad experience for the family, but the sadness came when it became clear that the cancer he had um, could not be treated mm -hmm. any further, um, that it was terminal. Um, and given that fact, then uh, both uh, Jack, my, my wife's brother, and um, the family were pleased that uh, the state of Victoria in Australia, where, where he was living, and the family, um, had also passed similar legislation to that which you described, um, so uh, voluntary aid in dying, uh, which in fact is now almost everywhere in Australia. The only place that it's not is, is the Northern Territory, which is a relatively small population. Um, so uh, uh, Jack was clear that if things got to the point where um, you know, he was in pain and distress um, and there was no hope of a further improvement, that he would want to use that legislation. Um, so he started f relatively early with the process, as soon as the doctors were willing to sign that he had less than six months to live. Um, he started to, because there is a process to go through, you have to um, make this request, uh, you have to have a cooling off period um, of a certain number of days, you have to make it again. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's wise if you're in this situation to start the process when you, you, you never really know in advance how things will go. But uh, that was all complied with. Uh, he got to the point where he decided his life was, was not worth living and, and the doctors uh, told him that it, it was only going to get worse. Um, he was in a hospital uh, already, in a Melbourne hospital. The hospital actually um, has now rooms set aside for people to use um, medical aid in dying. Mm -hmm. So um, he was moved upstairs to one of these uh, uh, attractive and more spacious rooms where um, the immediate family could, could gather uh, around him and, and say their farewells. Uh, and he was, he was at peace. He was you know, reconciled to this decision, if you like, as it was said in the video, accepting of his own mortality. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, so he was given the, the drug. He, swallowed it, he fell asleep um, very rapidly and uh, within a few minutes the doctors had said mm. that uh, he had died. Um, but the family was, was comfortted by that, that he'd been able to die in the, in the way that he mm. wanted to. Um, so it was clearly the, the best possible ending to the sad situation mm -hmm. that he was in. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, you mentioned he took the drug, was that self-administered or by IV? In his case, it was self-administered, um, and he didn't have a, a problem with that. He didn't, um, you know, he, was, he was certainly physically able to move, and he didn't have a cancer of the uh, esophagus, which might have blocked the digestion of it. There is a provision in the Victorian legislation, which I'm not sure whether it exists in any of the states in the US, that if you're unable to swallow, the doctor can put it into an IV. Um, that you can have. So um, it would have been possible anyway, um, but uh, if, if, if the patient is capable of self-administering, then that's what the law mm -hmm. prescribes. 
That's a wonderful um, addition to, to their law. Unfortunately, in the US, the IV administration is prohibited. And self-administration must be administered by an orifice. So whether rectal, if, if the digestive tract is unavailable. Um, but it can lead to some difficult circumstances. Right. Um, and this is an interesting contrast because the U.S. is, un is a, a unique, in a unique circumstance in this way. Um, other countries around the world, like Canada, Portugal, Colombia, offer IV administration. Um, in your book, Ethics in the Real World, uh, which is also available for sale downstairs, uh, you write about what is bearable. Um, how can we understand someone suffering and when that might be un intolerable or unbearable? I, I think that has to be um, an individual decision by the patient. I think that uh, we, can't, we don't really have objective standards of what's bearable and what's unbearable. People have different sensitivities to pain and they have a different sense of when life is, is worth continuing despite some pain. And that might depend, of course, on, on individual circumstances. Um, I've uh, you know, talked to people who've wanted to stay alive because they wanted to see the birth of their first grandchild, even though they knew they would not be able to accompany that grandchild um, mm -hmm. through the first years of life. But uh, they wanted to see it or uh, to hold their grandchild, or maybe they wanted to see their, uh, one of their children get married. And there's a whole lot of reasons a whole lot of things that you might want to actually participate in or, or complete, to, to refer to the completed life mm -hmm. idea. Things that you might want to complete and that you're still capable of completing, and so you'd put up with quite a lot in order to complete them. But once they're completed, then um, the, what you're suffering has become pointless and, and in that sense is not something that you're willing to bear. So um, I would see that uh, where the legislation includes those terms of, of uh, uh, pain or uh, unbearable suffering, I would like to see that always interpreted into, uh, as uh, suffering judged by the patient, um, competent patient, as unbearable for them. Hmm. Thank you. Our, our founder, Babe Summerfield, um, and the board chose the concept of uh, completed life uh, as essential to the conversation Faith wanted us to have. Uh, we, we just touched upon it a little bit. When you think of a completed life, by its very name, it, it indicates something might be incomplete. It also invites you to ask yourself, well, what are the categories that I might use as I define what a completed life is for myself, what ethical categories, moral categories, relational categories. Could you say a little bit more about that? Um, as, as what guidance could you give us as we think about what a completed life might look like, might feel like, what it might come to resemble with some attention given to that? Yes, well, um, you know, uh, early on I, start, I, I talked about uh, the importance of purpose in life um, mm -hmm. and trying to achieve things. And I think that is important as, and is rewarding for people. Um, but it will require certain, <coughs> certain capacities. Um, and uh, things can happen in life, maybe things inevitably happen uh, at a, you know, if one achieves a great age where one can no longer work for those purposes, where one does not have the capacities to carry them out. Now, there might still be other things, of course. One might just enjoy the company of other people. Um, and if you're continuing to enjoy that, you may see uh, life is not completed at that point. Or you may feel that you have completed those purposes. You may feel that, in fact, you're perhaps becoming a burden on some of those who are close to you. Um, that can be possible, of course, in different circumstances. Unfortunate, but it can happen. Uh, you might feel that you're restricting younger people from getting on with their lives, if they're having to care for you, um, from getting on with, and you may feel that their lives are actually more important than 
your life because you can no, no longer work for the things that you think worthwhile and there's relatively little that you can take pleasure in. Um, so, uh, but I think, I think that's again a personal decision as to what is a completed life for you. Um, when do you feel it's completed? And that's something which is debated now in some of those countries that were the pioneers in um, uh, assisted dying or, or voluntary euthanasia, uh, particularly, say, Belgium and the Netherlands. Um, the Netherlands was really the first country to allow the open practice of voluntary euthanasia, of, uh, differently from our assisted dying bills, of doctors giving lethal injections to patients on their request. Um, un under the conditions that the patient regarded the life as, as unbearable. Um, but there has been a discussion there uh, um, about uh, people who say simply they are tired of life, often people of considerable age, who feel they can't do very much, that life isn't bringing them rewards, um, and it's time to bring, to bring it to an end. Um, Belgium has now allows people to end their lives in those circumstances. The Netherlands... Um, is, is discussing it. It's had cases close to that, um, but is discussing it. And I think that's a discussion that countries uh, should have if when people want that. Um, so that's one thing. There's another aspect of this that, I, that I'd like to, to mention, and that is um, when people are aware of the onset of dementia. And today, in fact, is, is World Alzheimer's Day, so it's appropriate that we should be raising this topic. Um, one of the things which uh, the legislation both in, here in the um, United States and the states that have legislation and also in Australia um, and in a, a number of other countries does not properly grapple with is uh, people who are developing dementia um, but nobody knows how long they will still live so this requirement that uh, you have to be terminally ill in the sense of doctors have to say you are likely to die within six months um, is not satisfied. Um, but uh, by the time it is satisfied, by the time you're that close to death, you're no longer able to consent. Uh, you may no longer be able to consent to um, ending your life. So I think this is, this is something that we need also to think about. Um, there are various um, possibilities. Um, Peggy Batten, who, as you know, was, would have been here if it were not for her uh, health issues that developed suddenly, uh, wrote an, uh, co-authored an article in which she suggested that you could be implanted with a capsule that would release uh, a lethal drug that would, would kill you painlessly. Um, and and this, this, ca this capsule would have a certain uh, sort of duration. So after a, a given period, let's say three years, it would do that. Um, and so you would essentially know when you were going to die unless you remove the capsule. The capsule, um, in her hypothesis, is easy to remove. So it would give people some, some more control. But it's still not an ideal solution because you might want to die sooner than, than that, depending on when the capsule was, was implanted. Um, and there, there are clearly other possibilities. One is that you could um, hand over a medical power of, of attorney to somebody who could, was empowered to end your life, when they judged that your quality of life was no longer worth living, if you were no longer capable of making that decision. That would seem to me to be probably the, the best solution. Because otherwise what we're getting now is some people ending their life when, because they've had a diagnosis of dementia, um, but their quality of life is still quite good, still acceptable to them. Um, but the problem is that if they don't end their life while they still have the capacity to do this, um, then they won't be able to do it. So I have a friend, um, uh, I was close friends with, with both the husband and wife, and the husband started getting dementia. Um, mm. And uh, as I say, his quality of life was, was, was not bad, um, uh, but he didn't want to go in through this whole thing. Um, so he and his wife uh, went to Switzerland, as uh, Faith uh, did, uh, where the organization Pegasus um, uh, enabled uh, Bill, the husband, to, um, to end his life at a time of his choosing, when he was still competent. Um, so that can be done, but um, 
Not everybody can do that. Uh, Pegasus charges a fee for its services that is substantial. Um, and of course, not everybody will have the money to fly to Switzerland to, um, to do that. So uh, I think it's, it's, not a, you know, it's a very partial solution. Um, and I think we need to, to look at this issue and find ways of enabling people to live fully as long as possible with dementia, but not to go into this condition where they can no longer consent and therefore have to become, um, in the words of uh, Gillian Bennett, who was a Canadian who ended her life and wrote a testament to it, um, a mere husk or shell of her former self um, being looked after by people um, in a hospital, uh, having to change her and keep her clean uh, for no purpose at all that she could see. And I'm glad you mentioned Canada because um, my understanding is they have the waiver of final consent available for individuals who are diagnosed with dementia and who uh, may give up their final consent um, for so medical you're aid. that is in the legislation in Canada now? I'm not aware of that, I have to say. I, I know it's being discussed. It's, it's, um, so it's an interesting concept, yeah, right? Yeah. So what, what would you say, you know, for countries where um, aid in dying is legal, um, would you recommend the waiver of final consent, if, if possible? So when you say a waiver of final consent, is that uh, allowing somebody else to make the decision? And, and who makes that decision? Uh, it could be given to a, a proxy or surrogate. Right. So that would be like giving a, a exactly. power of attorney, exactly. a medical power of attorney to a, to a proxy. Yes, oh. I, I would. Yes, I, I would advocate that. I think that would, as I say, that would enable people with dementia to live longer. Um, so it's, if you like, it's a, it's a pro-life decision mm. to uh, add that to the uh, mm. medical aid in dying legislation. And it's an interesting framing, especially for individuals diagnosed with dim dementia and Alzheimer's. Um, and as you mentioned, today is, is World Alzheimer's Day, so we're thinking of everyone who's impacted by that illness. We want to thank uh, many of you for sending questions uh, to us, and we were able to uh, have some time and, and find some common themes from questions. And so uh, many in the audience were curious, for example, um, where you might stand on effective altruism, where it stands in light of recent events. Is it, is it still viable, in other words, and has your opinion changed? And, how might you speak to that, to those in the audience who are interested on that topic? Thank you very much. Um, yeah, affected altruism, effective altruism is, is another issue that I write about in um, both uh, The Life You Can Save and in, uh, and in the Ethics in the Real World uh, collection of essays. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the term, I think a lot of you probably are, but if you're not, uh, effective altruism is a movement that began in uh, about 2008, 2009. Uh, it was started by a couple of graduate students in philosophy at Oxford University, and I contributed to it in the sense that they had read an, an article that I'd written about that uh, quite a few years earlier. Um, so, as you would expect from the term altruism, it's, it's about trying to make things better for others, whether humans or non-human animals, whether living now or uh, will be living in the future. Uh, so it's about trying to produce a better world in that way. But the distinctive feature of it is that it urges people to look at the research as to how you can use whatever resources you're putting into your altruistic activities, how you can use them most effectively, get the biggest bang for your buck from them. And there is quite a lot of research now online. There wasn't... Uh, 20 years ago, but there is now, um, about that. Um, and the organization that I mentioned that uh, spun out of my book, The Life You Can Save, that uh, Charlie Bressler um, really built up, does exactly that in the field of, of helping people in extreme poverty. So it uh, curates a list of uh, 20 or so highly effective organizations that have been independently assessed as being among the most uh, effective in producing the kinds of assistance and change that we need to help people in extreme poverty for uh, the least possible cost. Uh, but the effective altruism movement also, uh, some people in it work for um, 
uh, against uh, intensive farming, the reasons I've given. Um, and quite a few of them are also concerned about reducing the risk of extinction of our species, because they argue that um, you know, we can in the future expect the world to be better than the world today, we can solve many of our problems, technology can provide everybody with all of their basic needs, um, and if we do survive through the risks of extinction in the next century or two, we will be smarter and better and um, perhaps make moral progress as well. Um, and it's uh, really important, therefore, that um, we reduce the risk of extinction, not just for ourselves, obviously that's important too, but, um, but for the future. Now, um, you asked, you know, has my views changed because of recent events? And I uh, assume that the, the recent event that has attracted the most attention is the downfall of Sam Bankman-Fried, who was for a time perhaps the most widely known effective altruist. Uh, Bankman-Fried was actually somebody who was interested in trying to make the world a better place, who uh, talked to some effective altruists um, about how to do this, and decided that uh, the, the best thing that he could do was to actually earn a lot of money um, and then donate uh, the great majority of that money to some of these <coughs> highly effective charities. Um, and at that, he was, or at least seemed to be for a time, spectacularly successful. He founded uh, FTX, the leading cryptocurrency exchange, and took uh, a percentage of, of every trade, which um, meant that um, at the age of 29, he was uh, said to be the richest person under 30, um, and his uh, assets were valued at $25 billion. Um, what uh, nobody knew at that time was that, as well as running this crypto exchange, um, he had a much more risky uh, investment fund called Alameda. And um, uh, Alameda had made some very bad bets, had lost billions of dollars, and to cover this loss and to prop it up, um, uh, FTX and <coughs> Bankman-Fried um, had, I should say, is alleged to have, because although he's been charged with offences, uh, he has not yet been tried, is, is alleged to have taken trust funds from his, the clients of, the, uh, of FTX, the crypto exchange, and use them to prop up Alameda. Uh, so um, he, FTX became bankrupt, um, he lost uh, his entire fortune and is facing uh, serious criminal charges, a totally disastrous outcome. Um, I don't think that that means that we should change our support for effective altruism. I don't think even it means that we should stop saying that um, earning money to give is um, a possible way of doing good. It's obviously, and was always only considered to be one way of doing good. You might go and work for some of the effective organisations, try to help them be more effective. You might go into um, research, perhaps medical research, to try to cure common diseases of uh, neglected diseases of uh, developing countries. Uh, you might go into research uh, to produce plants that can better withstand the, the drought and heat that we're likely to have with climate change, or uh, you know, research into speeding up the transition from fossil fuels. There's a huge range. You might go into politics and try to go to better policies. There's a huge range of things you can do, of which only to give is only one of them. It has perhaps become more suspect because, you know, I don't know exactly what happened with Sam Bankman-Fried. There's a number of articles starting to be written uh, about him, which maybe will shed some light on this. Um, I was interviewed recently for one that the New Yorker is, is uh, a writer for the New Yorker is, is putting out. Um, so I don't really know what went wrong, whether he just got tempted by, you know, having so much money and, want, and his reputation, not wanting to lose it. Um, obviously, it would have been better if he had given away a lot more a lot sooner. Um, <laughs> but, uh, Do you have the number in mind, maybe? <laughs> You know, I think anybody who has a billion could um, could give away uh, 900 million <laughs> pretty easily and still okay. feel that they're okay. Yeah, that's right. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I think what it shows is that, you know, you need to have a certain character, a certain uh, moral strength, if you like, to go into the earning to give line. It's more tempting maybe than others. 
to do things that are wrong. Um, and, you know, even at a simpler level, it's tempting to imitate the lifestyle of your peers who have similar amounts of wealth and who are spending it on um, very expensive, I don't know, luxury yachts or whatever it might be, um, and therefore not giving it away. So you need to have the moral character to withstand that, um, to keep doing it for the purpose that you're thinking of. And, and clearly, you know, not everybody has that moral character. But, um, but effective altruism itself, I, I don't see a reason to change support for the idea that, firstly, trying to make the world a better place should be one of our goals. And I've already said I think that's actually a, a goal that will reward you. There's psychological research to show that, um, yes, if you have these purposes, you will enjoy your life more, have a more positive evaluation. Um, and uh, um, so, yes, doing, that's, that's the altruism part. And secondly, yeah, of course, it, it seems obvious. Why not look at the research to get the most out of whatever you can give? You know, if you're going to buy a, a, a new phone or a new car, you'll probably do some research into what will actually give you what you want for the, what you can afford. So why not do it for your charitable donations? Really, in a way, it seems, seems a real no-brainer, but, uh, but the statistics show that the majority of people give much more impulsively. They, they don't do that research. Really helpful. There was uh, a question that, that Sarah and I appreciate, and this is for those of you who might not have an, an ethics or philosophy background, but Peter, we were wondering, uh, this question was, can you help those of us without that background to understand utilitarianism and... and, and sure. Thank you. <laughs> there Thank may you. be some converts out here. Right. Who, right who, many, yes. who are, um, okay. So, um, utilitarianism is a theory about what we ought to do. So you call it an ethical theory, a normative theory. It's a theory about how you ought to live your life and, and what makes some decisions right and other decisions wrong. Um, it belongs to a family of theories called consequentialism that, as you might expect, that means it judges right and wrong in terms of its consequences. The right action is the one that will have the best consequences of all the things that you could do. If you do an action that doesn't have consequences as good as an alternative action that you could do, it was the wrong thing to do. And utilitarianism is distinctive in this family of theories because it says when we talk about consequences, we are talking about the well-being of conscious beings, humans or non-human animals. Um, that is, we are talking about increasing happiness, minimizing suffering or pain or misery. Um, David, in introducing me, mentioned John Stuart Mill, but I would go back further to Jeremy Bentham. Uh, is the real founder of this theory, a real polymath who wrote an amazing amount on a lot of different topics, um, but uh, helped to develop the theory of utilitarianism <coughs> and helped to advocate it in the England in which he was living in a whole lot of different fields, varying from uh, the reform of the appalling prison conditions of his time to um, broadening the franchise, which was very narrow, so having a, a more democratic Britain at the time. And interestingly, he was, you know, the, the writings, a lot of his writings were not published in, in his own lifetime. Um, but when we look at him, he was incredibly progressive. Um, he argued for universal male suffrage. But the reason he did that, we know from his unpublished writings, is not because he thought that women would be less capable than men of, of voting uh, thoughtfully and making the right decisions, but because he was worried about being ridiculed. He thought it was pretty far-fetched already to us in Britain to advocate for universal male suffrage, and if he voted, if, if he supported women getting the vote, um, that would be ridiculed. So it was not until another 50 years when John Stuart Mill, who David also mentioned, another utilitarian, was elected to the British Parliament that he moved the first legislation to give the vote to women, which, as he knew, was defeated by a fairly substantial majority, but started the, the uh, political train that led eventually to enfranchising women in the United Kingdom. Uh, so, so that's the theory um, that we, we ought to be trying to um, act so as to maximize the surplus of, of happiness over misery in the world for all beings. One last question, uh, and, and this is perhaps why people are so fond of you, Peter, that you can take us from John Stuart Mill 
to chat GPT. <laughs> so there was uh, a sentiment uh, theme out there. Can, can AI be ethical? Okay, so the answer to that is um, yes. Um, it, I mean, that question could be interpreted in two ways. One is, do you think that using AI, introducing AI into society in the various ways that is now being introduced can be done ethically? The other way is, can AI itself be an ethical agent, an agent that you could praise or blame or say it did right or it did wrong? So I think the answer to both those questions are actually yes. But the first question, obviously, is one we can ask right now about AI as it exists. The second question, I think, uh, is, you know, AI is, is not a conscious machine yet. We don't have this. I don't rule out the possibility that we will get there. Um, but um, it's speculative. But if, but if we did get there, then, yes, it could be a moral agent. And incidentally, should any of you be interested in following this up further, um, I've been organising a conference at Princeton University for October 6th and 7th, Friday and Saturday, uh, so just a couple of weeks away, um, which the title is AI, Conscious Machines and Animals. And we're looking at bo both, these conf both these issues uh, on day one, more AI and conscious machines, on day two, AI and animals, um, but we're looking at the impact that they're having. Now, getting back to your question, um, one of the things that I and a, a co-author did was look at a lot of statements about how you can make AI, AI ethical. And there's a lot of statements around about, I think we came across about 70 of them. Um, and all but one of them really talk about AI must uh, serve the best interests of human beings. Um, and there are, there are a couple that actually said talk about human beings and the environment, which is already a bit of an extension. And we found just one, which comes out of Serbia, interestingly, which includes animals as well. And so, of course, given what I've said, you won't be surprised to think that I think AI must also be designed to serve the interests of animals. Um, and AI is already being used uh, to speed up uh, intensive farming, um, I think, in ways that may be designed to make possible even more higher density crowding of animals. Um, so that's, I think, something that we should object to. Um, it's also obviously being used to develop self-driving or autonomous vehicles, some of which are already driving now in uh, San Francisco, for example. Um, and there too, there are decisions that have to be made. Um, w will the car brake if there's a dog on the road? Will the car brake if there's um, a deer on the road? Or maybe it'll brake if there's a deer on the road because a deer is big enough to damage the car. Will it brake if there's a bird on the road? Um, there's a lot of decisions that need to be made that actually go beyond humans. But also, of course, there are a lot of decisions that need to be made for humans. And uh, there's a lot of concerns about AI. There have been concerns about AI being biased or discriminating against people on the grounds of their uh, race, or um, which may be related to their uh, zip code. Um, and I think we need to get rid of those biases, clearly. And that is something that people are working on. Um, there's questions about whether AI will produce wide-scale unemployment. Um, some people say no, and they, they point to the, uh, the Luddite movement against the introduction of uh, machines, of mechanical uh, uh, looms and so on in the Industrial Revolution. Um, but that didn't cause prolonged mass uh, unemployment. So I, th I think it's, it's something that, that's something that we really need to think about. Um, because AI, I think, will be more far-reaching in terms of replacing people in jobs. And then some people say, oh, well, yes, but we'll be so much more productive, we can give, pay them all um, a, a universal basic income so everybody will have enough to live on. Um, sure, but, but jobs don't just provide people with income, they also provide them with a purpose in their life. Um, and uh, I think we need to find ways of replacing that as well. So I think there's a lot of ethical work to be done, but I do think it's possible that we'll be able to use AI in a positive way for the benefit of, hopefully, humans and non-human animals as well. What a fascinating discussion and fascinating evening. Um, as our evening discussion draws to a, a conclusion, um, what ought the audience take away from tonight? 
Well, I, I hope you'll take away something that, uh, well, maybe two things, given, um, you know, something that I've, I've repeated uh, a few times is um, think about your purposes and values in life. What are your deepest values? Um, I would say, you know, if Charlie Bressler were here, he would say, don't just stay with a job because, um, you know, you can do it and because you're earning enough to be quite comfortable. Um, think about whether you're actually fulfilling your greatest values um, because uh, you may actually improve your life. You, whether or not you improve your finances, you may improve your life by um, working in accordance with those purposes that um, are really most authentically you. So that's, that's one thing, but then of course, as this is an evening set up by the Completed Life Initiative, um, I would certainly say, um, you know, this is a movement that exists in different forms and different organizations. Um, as you said, there's something you can work with, um, the Completed Life Initiative, with the bioethics program in the School of Professional <laughs> Studies at Columbia, with other organizations who are doing this. Uh, you can contact your legislators if, if there's a discussion going on in New Jersey now about removing the residential requirement. Uh, I think that would be a good thing. So you can tell your legislator that, uh, state legislator, that's what you want. If you're in New Jersey, you can say, sorry, if you're in New, New York State, you can say, contact your legislator and say, hey, how is it that uh, New, New Jersey uh, has this legislation, um, Vermont, uh, Maine, um, and a number of other states, California, Oregon, Washington, um, have it, um, but we don't. Why can't we have the same choices that uh, they do? Well, thank you, Peter. I want to thank Peter for an amazing evening. Thank you. And, and let's give a hand. We can't have an interesting conversation without good questions, so <laughs> let's thank Sarah and Matt for their questions. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Um, I know that our founder, Faith Summerfield, would be so pleased with this evening. Um, just a terrific conversation, so thank you. So our night con uh, continues on the terrace. Please join us for drinks. Um, uh, and thank you all so much for coming again tonight. Another round of applause for Peter.